Good afternoon. Good Eftel Middag. First of all, I want to thank organizers for their invitation to speak at this conference. So I thank OBU Academy and Center for Global Non-Killing for this opportunity to bring into academic attention some aspects of our global crisis that are frequently missing. My speech will have two main parts. The first one dedicated to the geopolitical importance of non-killing choices in times of civilization collapse and the roots of this collapse. In the second part, I will speak uh, about our common responsibility as what I have called fractional, indirect, delayed carbon killers. But first, let me begin with a little terminological criticism. In the title of this conference, we can see the term climate crisis. It is a terminology that we can not only find at conference titles or news articles, but also increasingly in activism campaigns, for example, the famous Extinction Rebellion movement, and even at academic works. Yet, I think this use of the word crisis is quite wrong, and I will try to explain why. The word crisis, both for its etymology and its use in most world languages, has a meaning of temporality. If we look at the various meanings in an English dictionary, like the Merriam-Webster, for example, we will see that it refers to a turning point, an attack, an event, a moment. This means that a crisis is, by definition, something limited in time, and usually a short time. And if you speak of a crisis as a historical event, it will mean that it has a short duration in historical terms, typically some months, years, or decades at most. But we, but we, industrial homo sapiens, or as sociologist William R. Catton used to call Homo Colossus, have done to Earth's climate is not a crisis because it's not temporary. This is obviously a change, so the classic climate change term is covered. But this is not a brief change which could be reversed or finished and then come back to the previous state or give pass to a new state of equilibrium. That's the reason why I don't think we should use this term. Because it's not correct and what is worse, it could give society the impression, through the common understanding of crisis as an event limited in time, that this change is not here to stay. But I'm a non-conformist and a hypercritic, so I don't even like much the classic climate change terminology. And this is because of a similar reason. Correct as though it can be, the word change immediately gives people the false impression of taking us from one stable state to another state, also stable. You can find lots of news in mainstream media telling us that the warming state of our areas will make possible to grow some new crops from southern areas. For example, they say that my Atlantic green country of Galicia will be more like the Mediterranean parts of Spain or that Siberia will be a prosperous agricultural area with warmer temperatures. But that is a wrong picture of what waits ahead. We have definitely destroyed Holocene's climate stability, and we are entering a period of chaotic climate conditions that will last hundreds or even thousands of years before it eventually gets to a new equilibrium. That's what happens when you mess with so complex dynamic systems as Earth climate system is. And that's what climate scientists and system dynamic scientists are telling us. So the term which I prefer and which I will use in my conference will be the more accurate, more informative and descriptive of climate chaos. Well, then I go with the main first part of my conference. Geopolitical importance of the non-killing choice in times of civilization collapse. The classic work by Glenn Page, on Killing Global Political Science, gave a clear outlook of the various forms of killing that we can find in modern societies, 
and how non-killing approach could work to remove them from individual choices, from society structures, and from our very cultures. And that was a good account for times of business as usual of the global society, but now we have entered an exceptional historical time, with no precedence in human history, so I consider that an updated non-killing approach is needed. The absolute novelty in our historical time is not only climate chaos, as we all know by now, but also the end of cheap and abundant energy. There would be a third major aspect of our age that is totally new for humans, the high level of biodiversity loss, what many have called the sixth massive extension. It would be very pertinent for a law of group the fact that this extension is caused by humans, and that it's not only a massive killing but also a definite killing, a complete extinction of species by the thousands each and every year. But I will leave this fact outside of my equation, and I will limit my analysis to the anthropocentric point of view by now. Now let's put our look on peak energy. Of course, this is the reverse of the problem of climate chaos, because industrial society is disrupting Earth's climate system mainly by burning up all those huge amounts of cheap-to-get fossil fuels. But Social discussion is centering on the climate side of the problem, forgetting or just ignoring the energy decline side. And that's very dangerous. Beginning with the so-called energy transition, which has entered the social and political agenda in just recent years. Politicians, most thinkers and activists, often take for granted that all we have to do is transition from finite fossil and nuclear fuels to renewable energies. But this is not so simple. I will dare to say that it is even impossible if by transition we mean to change the energy source of our industrial mega machine as just keep on doing the same things. More clean, more green, and keep on growing forever and ever. We take out the fossil battery of our planetary industrial metabolism and replace it with a green one. No, that won't be possible. I don't have the time here to detail all the limits of renewable energy that make this replacement unfeasible. Let's just say, with Australian activist and thinker Ted Trainer, that renewable energy cannot sustain a consumer society. That's the point to focus before we even start to try any transition away from fossil fuels. Biophysical scientists Coil researchers, promoters of the growth, ecological economists, all have given enough proofs of this, if we take the time to search for them. And we are bold enough to drop our technology beliefs, as Spanish philosopher Jorge Riefman often calls it, which usually make people blind to the laws of physics and to the impossibility of technological merit. This Spanish philosopher has written, We are headed for a genocide together with an ecocide, and that is what I call an omnicide, the killing of all life on Earth, what some have started to call the Gaia side. Because a runaway climate chaos could turn our beloved and miraculous Earth into a dead planet like Venus, which is believed to have suffered its own runaway climate change thousands of millions of years ago, losing all possibilities to hold life. And we could well cause this if we don't stop carbon emissions, because even although fossil fuels are entering their decline period after peak oil, peak coal and peak gas, there is plenty, still plenty of them to fry the biosphere. To stop aggravating climate chaos, it's necessary to stop carbon emissions and for that mission, there is no other way than to stop economic growth, to let global GNP to drop, and maybe necessarily to make it drop quickly. I will repeat this absolutely fundamental idea. No green transition to renewable energies will stop emissions if we don't stop growing our economies. 
A growing number of authors are speaking of civilization collapse. To make clear what we mean by that, we can resort to one of the authors who has better studied and described, described collapse of past civilizations, Joseph Schellinger. In his words, a collapse is a sudden loss of complexity in a complex society. You have a complex society, and then for some reason, complexity is quickly lost and you end up with a much simpler society. Painter measures time in historical terms, so sudden, in his definition, would translate into human terms for several decades to a few centuries. Nothing more than that. I mean, a collapse is not the apocalypse but nothing less. For societies, like industrial global society, which have only known a continuous growth since a couple of centuries, this is quite a change. And the main driver for the upcoming collapse of a civilization, apart from the ecological consequences of climate chaos, loss of biodiversity, loss of soil and fresh water, and other aspects of the current ecological predicament, is energy decline because complexity is a function of energy. When societies manage to get more energy, they can afford more complexity. Stronger state, more and better services, more careers and professions, and public workers, hospitals, schools, universities, etc. Even only maintaining a given level of social complexity requires increasing amounts of energy, just like the Red Queen in Lewis Carroll's through the looking glass, you have to run faster and faster just to stay at the same place. So when total available energy starts an overall decline for the first time in millennia, a reduction in social complexity is unavoidable. And that is exactly what we call a collapse. Many people say, let's save the planet, is a wrong slogan, because the planet will continue, life on it will continue, despite all the damages humans could inflict and so we humans are the only ones at fair. But that's not true. There are two real chances. If all prehistorical carbon is released through a runaway climate change, triggered by positive feedbacks like flat rates and methane release from permafrost at the Arctic, like the loss of the Amazonas, etc., that could cause the same effect on Earth that it's believed to have happened in Venus aeons ago. This sister planet once had conditions for life on water and an atmosphere, but a runaway climate change made it lose water and atmosphere and then it became a planet no longer able to hold out. So it is true that we humans could eventually kill planet Earth, kill the biosphere, commit the genocide. If we don't put a strong break to climate chaos, stopping all greenhouse gas emissions before it's too late. So here we have the great killing with a main key, the omni-killing, the omnicide which I was talking about. And together with this hom ominous outlook, we have the added problem of human competition versus human cooperation, of killing versus non-killing, of democratic solutions versus Hovetian fight of all against each other. Glenn Page said, Non-killing sharing of scarce resources is not unthinkable. Of course it's not unthinkable, but that's very far from the present official geopolitical agenda of how to manage this climate chaos and this energy decline. As long as we have reached the planetary limits to grow, and no escape from this planet is realistic. We must conclude that as long every nation that persists in pursuing economic growth will be able to do it only by depriving other nations of the resources to feed that growth. So I can easily imagine a European Union trying its own energy transition and green growth and green deal and all of that by exacerbating extractivism and neocolonialism or neo-imperialism in the global south by taking its most polluting factories to China or somewhere else, by taking for itself the scarce minerals, the last fossil fuels from outside its border, and defend them by all means necessary, of course, military means, 
but also economic means just to keep on growing a few decades until all this is also gone. Until all solar panels and wind turbines need replacing and there is no more materials and no more fossil energy to mine them in Europe, in Europe or abroad. And I can more easily imagine Trump's America trying the same, Australia trying the same, every rich nation or wannabe rich nation trying to do the same, and tragically many of them with nuclear power, as Spanish engineer and energy expert Pedro Prieto has reminded us in a terrific article at 151515 magazine. Let me repeat this idea. When total energy declines, if you want to keep your per capita consumption levels, the only way is to steal others their part of the shrinking pie. Just as difficult as it has proved to be to distribute with international justice the reduction of carbon emissions, it will be equally or more difficult to make all countries agree in the distribution of the lack carbon consumption, the last drops of oil or natural gas or uranium or lithium. The geopolitical and cultural obstacles are just the same. They are both both sides, the source size and the sink side, of our same metabolic global predicament. Let's remember Bush Senior's words at Rio de Janeiro Earth Summit in 1992. The American way of life is not negotiating. Enough so. So this imperialistic, non-cooperative, non-democratic rush for the last resources in times of climate chaos will make non killing more necessary and more urgent than ever before in history. Non-violence in these times of civilization collapse needs to translate into ethical maxims like this. I will only maintain a consumption level that does not kill you and that can allow you to live a similar consumption level. Or as Mahatma Gandhi famously put it, to live simply so others may simply live. And to end this first part of my talk, I won't forget that this conference takes physical place in Scandinavia that a non-killing, non-violent, internationally fair approach to the energy descent, descent that could help to collectively, collectively do a peaceful descent path is the Uppsala Protocol, a proposal made by British retired geologist Colin Campbell in 1996, which was developed in 2005 in a book format by American expert Richard Heimler, with the title of The Old Depletion Protocol a plan to avert all oil wars, terrorism and economic collapse.